here in Waterville this afternoon, those of you who have joined us physically. Uh, for those of you who are online, you're missing the beautiful delights of South Kerry. The sun is shining at the moment, believe it or not, no rain. Uh, so we have a, a fabulous panel to talk to us today. Uh, I'm Tim Hayes, I'm Head of Communication at the European Commission representation in Ireland. And, and what we like to do is we like to have events around the country in different parts of the country. And this is one of a series of events uh, that we've been holding. Uh, so the last series of events that we've had have been on the, on the Green Deal. Uh, and we've spoken about different aspects of the Green Deal. And the Green Deal is, is quite important because it is our reaction uh, to the illegal invasion of Ukraine by Russia and the desire of the EU to move away from the use of, of fossil fuels. So we need to become more self-sufficient with, with energy. And um, we've got to be really careful to make sure that we meet our climate change targets. You would have seen in the newspapers recently the difficulties that some of the Mediterranean countries are having uh, with, with heat waves, and all of that is down to the climate change, of course. So this event in particular, we're going to look at the so-called the blue economy. Uh, and we're joined by, on my left, we have uh, Grace O'Sullivan, who is the MEP for Ireland South, or an MEP for Ireland South, the Green MEP. Uh, and then we're joined by, to my right, uh, Lucy. Uh, Lucy will introduce herself. Uh, and then we've got Katrina on the left-hand side. So each of the panellists will speak for about eight or ten minutes. We will then sort of floor open to questions, both from you here uh, sitting in the hall and for those watching online. And for those watching online, we're going to use Slido for questions. And the Slido code is in your, your box uh, on your panel. But just in case you can't see it there, the code you type in Slido is 3386715. So after the presentations by the three panelists, uh, we will take some questions from the floor, some from Slido, some from the floor, some from Slido. And we will run for about, uh, until about 10 past quarter past uh, four thereabouts. So we'd like to get people on the road again to make sure they enjoy the rest of the day. So we start with uh, Ireland South MEP, Grace O'Sullivan from the Green Party. Grace, you've got eight to 10 minutes starting now. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much, Tim. I've never been a good uh, timekeeper and I always put that down to being Irish. But um, firstly, I just want to say it's absolutely wonderful be here in Waterville again. Um, I would have come down here years ago to see Lucy in Sea Synergy, um, who was doing tremendous work, but it's a real honour and privilege for me to be uh, here uh, in Kerry. And I drove down from uh, Dingle uh, earlier today, um, and it's, it's, you know, it's a very precious environment. So I would uh, thank Tim um, and the, the Commission for hosting the event here in this uh, beautiful centre um, and giving us and uh, myself the opportunity to travel down here and uh, to be here with you today. And uh, those who are coming in online, I would say, um, I'm, you know, uh, I'm sorry you're not with us because it is really a very special place and particularly for me coming from Brussels um, where I've been over the last few weeks and uh, to come to this environment is um, truly precious. So I want to talk um, about the European Green Deal because um, that was the flagship that was launched on the table uh, by the President of the European uh, Parliament, or our European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, um, back in 2019. And, um, and that was um, before um, we saw the, um, the ferocious attack on uh, Ukraine. And you know, at the time, um, as a Green member of the European Parliament, um, it looked like you know it was going to be all fair and plain sailing. Things looked really up for us because the Green Deal was um, uh, recognizing um, and acknowledging that there are limits to growth, that we are moving beyond the capacity of our home, called planet Earth, to sustain uh, our populations. And why? Because of, very much because of the way we have been living over the last number of decades, and how we became absolutely dependent on fossil fuels, which uh, now uh, we're in a runaway climate change. 
And as someone who campaigned on um, the area of climate change over in the last 30 years through my work with Greenpeace and, and beyond, um, you know, it's just like I have to keep uh, an element of hope in my heart and go, you know, uh, and keep uh, pushing and hoping um, that it's never too late um, and that at a certain point there will be enough people together uh, and we will uh, meet the, the targets because we will have absolutely no choice but to do that. So the Green Deal has been on the table since 2019. It's uh, a pathway to um, decarbonise our economies in a fair and just way. So uh, they use the term to leave no one behind, that uh, all sectors have a role to play and all societies have a role but also have to be we have to remember that there are different members of our community um, who uh, have uh, different sensibilities or vulnerabilities um, and on that basis it's really important that there is a just transition then um, just to, to kind of move back home in 2018 I was a member of Shannon Dairy, so the Irish Senate, and I brought forward a motion um, calling for 50% of the waters around Ireland to be set aside for marine protected areas. Now, I was being extremely ambitious. Um, what we talk about today is 20%, 30% of marine protected areas, um, and uh, by 2030. But the reason I pushed the boat out, to, so to speak, was no one was speaking about the oceans. And for us as uh, um, members of Irish, uh, Irish and, and new Irish um, uh, and uh, living on the island of Ireland with seven and a half thousand kilometres of coastline, precious coastline, um, and more than seven, uh, and the land area, the sea area is more than seven uh, um, times the size of the, the land area. I just thought it makes pure sense for us to, as a member of the European Union, to look at the natural resources we have available to us and how can we leverage those in a way that doesn't um, cause uh, destruction but actually that is done in a, in a regenerative way. Um, and so uh, in uh, 2018, I put forward that motion. And I realized that one of my jobs in the Shannon was to actually go around from party to party to party to independent and to talk about uh, the importance of ocean ecology, ocean biodiversity, ocean, the ca capacity of the ocean to sequest carbon. So to help us, the ocean is, is like is that machine that is so critically important for the, the continuation of uh, life on the planet. So um, in any case, my motion passed, but it was a motion. It didn't. It was more like a, 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 a grand idea and to make people more aware. And um, so since going into Europe, um, over the last few weeks, the issue you might be most aware of is the uh, legislation that was following on the suite of legislation that passed to decarbonise. So this was the legislation, we've had what they call the Fit for 55 package, where we start looking at our modes of transport, where we start looking at how we grow our food, where we grow our food, the conditions of our soil, all so loads of different uh, uh, types of legislation looking at all sectors to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And then the next pillar of that, so remember we're, this is all happening over the last few years, 2019, 2020, 2021, um, and now we're on to the, the biodiversity side of that, So and that's the nature restoration law. And, uh, if you haven't heard of the nature restoration law, I'd say you must have your head deeply in the sand or under the ocean for the last number of weeks because it's become the most contentious piece of legislation that probably has ever passed um, the European Parliament. 
Um, what happened was uh, there is a general consensus that we that and a recognition that nature is in decline. 85% of EU uh, protected habitats are in poor condition, um, and that we have to turn the tide, and we have to start to look at not only how we protect nature, but how can we restore it? How do we rehabilitate? So just think to yourself, you know, when you need to rehabilitate take yourself what you have to do. Same goes for us with nature. So this um, legislation was put forward, very comprehensive piece of legislation, and that was one of the sad things, was it kind of got lost in the, the minutity of, of some of the, the articles of the language. So the word probably re-wetting and bogs was what people heard more than anything. But actually the legislation covers the whole marine area and that's pushing for 20% of uh, protected areas by um, over uh, the next years to 2030. Uh, we in the Green Party would be um, more ambitious and we would be pushing for 30 by 2030. Um, so, uh, but we should, and just to finish on the nature restoration law, it became highly contentious. It covered land, it covered sea, it co covered cities, it covered towns, it covered trees. Just think of trees over the last few weeks. I mean, you're very lucky here in Waterville and, and in Kerry, but I swear it, over the last few weeks in Strasbourg, the European Parliament, and in Brussels, the European Parliament, that these in these cities, you, you were gagging for a tree to sit under for shelter. You know, this, the heat has been uh, unprecedented. We know from the oceans there's been uh, five degrees warming out in the Atlantic. So um, in it, it, we managed uh, by a very, very tight margin to keep the legislation on the table. It's now gone to trilogue. So the European Parliament has its position the European Commission has its position. Uh, well, it initiated the legislation. European Parliament and the European Council are the co-legislators. So we both have positions. And now there's the discussions going on um, to try to hold uh, some of the content, the important content, to make sure that we uh, enable systems to restore nature. Uh, and as I said to you, the marine component is really important. There's not enough people talking about the marine component of any legislation. Now they're in the Irish Parliament, it's getting better um, over the last few years, or in uh, Europe. So we need, we need more momentum in that regard. Um, and then, uh, yes, yeah, so um, we've seen 2018, we had about 2% of our waters were around Ireland um, were uh, in under protected status, so special areas of conservation. Um, and now that's been pushed up to over 8%. So we have new uh, special areas of conservation uh, off the Kerry Cork coastline, 280 kilometres off there. And then we have uh, new uh, areas up off Mayo. The Minister, uh, Malcolm Noonan, is hoping to have the legislation in place to get the, the um, marine protected areas to, to get underway so that we're not just talking about them forever. Most important for me is that there's full consultation process with all stakeholders. That engagement is really important. There has been engagement, but we need much, much more. So that's why I've been traveling around Ireland South, which is the constituency area that um, I'm uh, a cover. Um, and I was delighted when Tim said I was deep, whoa, but actually I'm not. There's several uh, other MPs and, and we're, we all tend to, it's interesting because we all have different competences and we kind of focus in on different areas. So the area of the Marine would be as an ecologist, a trained ecologist who did a lot of field work around the coastal areas of interest for me. So look, I'm going to leave it at that. I'll, um, I'm here for questions and that if we, if we don't get to answer questions uh, during the time allotted, um, uh, for those who are here in person, I'll be outside uh, for a while afterwards. And then for those who are online, um, 
feel free to contact my office. So thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for that, Grace. And uh, our next speaker is Lucy, and Lucy is a local. Uh, she's a Indologist and she is very interested in ecotourism and everything to do with me, but she's going to introduce the salad, she told me. <laughs> um, so Lucy, uh, Lucy, about eight to ten minutes as well, and then after the three speakers have finished, we'll sort of throw up for questions. Perfect. Thank you. Sounds good. Um, Cade Mill of Falta, so my home turf, Waterwell. I grew up about a mile outside of the village in a place called the Smuggler's Inn. And the Innie Strand, or it's known as the Golf Links Beach, is my blue backyard. So ever since I was a child, I've um, had a big connection with the ocean. I was very lucky I learned to scuba dive when I was 12. So the whole underwater world was opened up to me. And that was just in Derinan and the offshore islands of Deanish and Scar. So some of my best memories have been built with the ocean. And um, I think it's been a huge part of my family. So when something is a big part of your family, you want to protect it. It's like part of you. So as you would with your gran or your granddad or your parents or brothers, you want to protect them and look after them. Um, so that's what I've been trying to do for most of my life, even since I was a tiny child. Um, it's Shark Week, whoever knows about uh, the ocean, it is Shark Week around the world and there's lots of raising awareness of sharks. And I just want to tell a quick story on sharks here. Um, a lot of people will have heard of basking sharks, but back in 2008, not many people knew that there were basking sharks. Um, and I got a phone call from a friend saying there are sharks around Hogs Head, so that's the headland just outside of here. And I, I was like, really? Okay, let me check it out. So headed out there and did a little bit of online research as well once looking at these massive animals, 12, 10 to 12 meters in length, and they were just swimming around, gliding, and on both sides of Hog's Head. So this is the headland just out to the south. And anyways, I said to my brother, who's also a water baby, let's get in. We don't know like if we'll ever get a chance to see them again. So we donned our snorkeling gear and headed into the ocean. And it was a soup of plankton. So it was just full of plankton. Mackerel were just in shoals with their mouths wide open feeding. And the next thing you would see a massive white mouth glide by and a huge body. And I was blown away. Um, so that was like a, a momentous moment in my life that made me think you know, we have everything here in Ireland with marine life, there's so much here. The following week, I was going to the Maldives to study manta rays, but the, my heart and my head were all the time back at home wondering what, who's studying these, these basking sharks. So came back after some travels and some research on manta rays and, and whale sharks, thinking me to study these basking sharks. And so with Simon Barrow from the Irish Whale and Dolphin Group and some other amazing scientists, some of them here in the room, um, we started the Irish Basking Shark Study Group. And I was one of the first female scientists to tag a basking shark in Ireland. And since um, then, there's been many other studies um, that ha I'm not always involved in or haven't been involved in for a while um, that are studying these amazing creatures that are living on our coastline, the basking sharks. Um, and if anyone is interested in getting involved with the ocean and more ocean encounters, the Irish Whale and Dolphin Group is a great organisation. So I've had amazing encounters with blue whales, fin whales, minke whales, dolphins, all off the coast here, off the Kerry coast. It's been fantastic. So I wanted to share these encounters with as many people as I could, raise awareness about the ocean, and in 2014, I opened up Sea Synergy Marine Awareness and Activity Centre. So there, our mission is to connect people with the ocean, to provide access to people um, for to get to know the ocean. And I often say to fall in love with the ocean as much as we love the ocean, so that they want to protect it. I believe you have to be emotionally connected with something to care for it. So we do that through education. We run the Marine Explorers Education Programme for the Marine Institute around the primary schools in Kerry, and Tash is here, she organises all of that. 
um, as well as our activities. And our activities are all about connecting people with the ocean. So we bring families snorkeling, we bring them on seashore safaris. And what is really great for me is that they might come as a family together enjoying their first ever encounter on a snorkel. But we've built a memory for them that the ocean is part of. So they'll always have the ocean as part of that memory. And then with our seashore safaris, we have um, families come to the area and they go back home uh, after an exploration with us and they've told us that their whole lives have changed around the coast because they see their own local coast in a completely different way. So they're b building a relationship. Another part of our work is research. So we've been doing a lot of research and bringing interns in from around the world, from different universities, studying marine ecotourism, plastics, microplastics and mussels. And more recently, we've been looking at the native oyster population on the Ibera Peninsula. Um, native oysters are endangered, and it's been quite an amazing journey since 2020. A fisherman showed me a picture, sent me a picture on Facebook, of an oyster that was around the size of a uh, Coke bottle. And it, there was a bottle in the photo. And I said, these are interesting. Let's study these. So we had a Puerto Rican student come from the University of Miami to study the population of oysters with us. And we found out that we found some of the largest native oysters reported. And they're just here on the peninsula. So we, we discovered that with the local um, uh, fishermen. So that, that will be reported in the Irish Nature Journal in autumn. So just on that, research is so important um, and funding for research is so important because we're talking about restoration, yet if we don't have the research done, we don't know what's there and we, have, we can't restore what we haven't measured. So I think it's really, really important. Um, Again, and then our bigger aim for that project is to have a restoration project on these um, oysters, these native oysters. So, so we'll be getting all into the nature restoration law there. Um, and then I think just looking at the Kerry County Council Climate Action Plan, restoration is not mentioned at all. So um, it's really important to have a joined up thinking when we're talking about climate, nature restoration, and the biodiversity um, laws that are coming into place as well. I know in the National Marine Protected Area Bill that came through last year, it's mentioned three times. So that's, that's positive, but it should probably be in there more. Um, just moving from restoration to rights, um, some of the work that I work on internationally with a round the world sailing race called the Ocean Race, formerly known as the Volvo Ocean Race, we talk a lot about recognizing the inherent rights of the ocean. So you might have heard of nature's rights, and it's very similar to legal personhood of nature. So just as humans have rights or corporates have rights, we think that nature and the ocean should have its rights recognized. So some of the work we've been doing over the past few years is raising awareness of this, but speaking with legal experts on how this can actually happen. And in September this year, we'll be presenting draft principles for a universal declaration of ocean rights um, to the United Nations General Assembly um, and some of the members there. So that'll be during Climate Week in New York. And it's really about the ocean's rights to thrive and regenerate and make sure that those rights are recognized. I think we must remember we are all part of nature. We're not apart from nature. So if we are talking about nature restoration, we're also looking at restoring ourselves, as you said. Um, so it's restoring our relationship with nature, restoring nature, and especially restoring the marine ecosystems. It's vital for humanity. The ocean is the blue heart of planet Earth. And if the ocean wins, we all win. Okay, thank you very much, Lucy, uh, and that's a nice thought to finish your presentation with. Uh, our third speaker for the afternoon is uh, Katrina Nee and Katrina works in the Marine Institute in, in Galway, 
uh, and her job basically is to use science to form the basis on which the government can make decisions uh, on cleaning up our ocean and cleaning up our act. Uh, I'm not sure if that microphone is working, if not I'll give you this one. Uh, but Katrina, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank, you. Um, thank you all. It's really great to be out down here, Kerry. I don't get the opportunity to come down. I'm based in Galway. I don't get the opportunity to come down this direction too often, so I'm delighted to get the opportunity today. Um, I like like our panelists here. I've you know I have an innate kind of love of the sea, and I you know really kind of feel it's part of me. And I grew up along the sea in, in Dublin, but please don't hold that against me. Uh, this account anyway. Um, yeah, so I'm working now in the Marine Institute, I've been there quite a while. Um, the Institute, if you don't know, the, the, agency, the agency were, um, were responsible for uh, providing scientific and, and advisory and economic services to government and to other, you know, in industry and other agencies and so on. We also kind of fund research and carry out research for, for the seas. Um, we, we, my specific role is to provide um, scientific and technical advice and make sure that the Department of Housing um, has technical advice that they need um, in their water services, which are you know, around the Water Framework Directive, and Marine Spatial Planning, and Marine Environmental Legislation, and Marine Strategy Framework Directive. They're two pieces of European legislation that Ireland has to deliver on. Um, so yeah, so today, today I want to talk to you a little bit about um, what the, why? I mean, uh, Grace has already mentioned about the nature restoration law and um, you know European Green Day Deal. And I want to talk about why um, why this is important, and particularly why it's important to Ireland. And um, so, nature restoration, you know, is really important uh, to our seas. And what the other thing I want to talk today about is like what we're doing in Ireland um, to, to deliver uh, nature restoration. We were already doing work to try and you know, to, to deliver nature, nature restoration. And I want to like, touch on that up as well. And it's, it's right that this, the law is progressing through um, through Europe. And I think that you'll see that, that kind of evolving so much more into the future. Um, so I just, you know, my screen here. So. Okay, not to worry. So yes, yeah, so I suppose in Ireland, I suppose the first the first thing to mention is why why is it important in Ireland? Well, in Ireland we have um, a very important marine economy. Um, there's se seventy one. No, sorry, one sec now. I'm sorry, I have to have this in front of me while I'm chatting. It's always the way. It always, Technology it always, always does says, yeah. Yeah, it decides to lock them. Yeah. Strong password. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. That's it exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so in Ireland, I suppose the first thing to mention is why why are our seas important? I mean, I think everybody appreciates why our seas are important. Um, it's, you know, it provides, um, 74 percent of the earth is covered in the ocean, and it provides 50 percent of the air that we breathe um, from marine phytoplankton. Um, it also is a source of food, um, it, it's, it regulates our climate, and you know, it's really important from the point of view of biodiversity. I think we've already touched on all of these. But particularly in Ireland, um, we have 40% of the Irish population, population live within five kilometres of the sea. And so I, th I think that's really important. So people you know, have kind of feel that bond with the sea. They think it's very important to our lives. And our economy, our ocean economy in Ireland, it's worth almost five billion. Um, so a lot of people are actually employed in mar marine related jobs. Um, there are, I think it's um, a total of 32,000 people um, that, that are in marine related jobs. Um, at the same time, though, uh, our, our seas are, they're, they're, they're overexploited. Um, so th there is problems, we have problems with you know, marine litter, and um, there's pressures on our seas relating to um, you know, trawling activities, marine traffic, coastal erosion. Um, so there's a lot of pressure on our seas, and I think that's really important. And that's why the, the, the nature restoration law is really important for us. Um, so I think, I think as well, obviously, climate change is another issue we've already heard a little bit about. But we need, that's something as well that we need to address um, in, um, nationally in Ireland. So, so the nature restoration law is really important for us. Um, so so why, why is that? We need to, we need to increase our biodiversity. Um, we need to make sure that, we, that, the nature, that nature is protected and that, that it's available to do the things that it does for free. Um, so we want to really minimise those negative effects on, on the ocean. 
And so it's really, really important that we, we do um, develop this nature restoration and so on. Um, so in Ireland, I suppose, nature restoration in Ireland, there's a few things I wanted to, to mention around that. Um, it's not only about protecting our biodiversity, we also need to balance it with um, the sustainable development of our waters. The, um, oh, since uh, over the last number of years, we're really seeing this um, increasing demand on our oceans. Um, it, it's amazing actually looking you know, here in Waterville and seeing how you know the cable, there's, the, there's a kind of heritage here and the cable that came ashore um, back in the 1880s, I think it was, I saw the notice board earlier on today. So you know, technology, it's not, not a new thing. But there is definitely more demand now that this kind of offshore wind developments are in on the horizon. By 2030, we're going to have you know five gigawatts of offshore wind off our coasts in Ireland. So we, we need to make sure all development is done sustainably. And, and we have to and what we're doing, I suppose, to do that is in Ireland, we're making sure we have you know, a supportive uh, policy framework. So I think you can see that whether it's the offshore wind, whether it's the marine protected areas, um, you know, this that definitely kind of a move towards having that more supportive marine policy framework. So that's really positive to see. And from my own point of view, what I really um, where we are involved is uh, from the science and the evidence side of it. You know, making sure that all these policies can be implemented with, based on evidence, so that we provide solid, robust evidence on that decisions can be made. So that's that's where we come in. Um, yes, the other, the other thing then as well, I think and you touched on it already, Lucy, the importance of research and research funding. Um, there's, it's really, there's really um, no doubt about it that you know, we need to invest more in marine research and so on. But the, the Institute is already doing research and, and funding research. Um, so I think that's kind of somewhere that we can improve. And I know nationally we're developing a new uh, RI strategy, research strategy. Um, and it's, it's in process, but it's a marine research strategy that's in development. So I look forward to seeing that, but it, it's, a, it's a work in progress at the moment. So keep your ears posted on that one. Um, we've already touched on the, the, the protected areas. So we know that there's a new bill in process. This just recently, um, the Department of Housing have completed um, a sensitivity, well, it was it, with UCD led it, um, a, a sensitivity study of the IRC. And that was really important to see that piece of evidence there, so that you know decisions around offshore wind can also take account of you know potentially sensitive um, habitats um, in particular areas. So you know so that, that there is a lot of work going on around that evidence, making sure evidence is available for for um, decision makers. Um, so the other thing I wanted to mention, just in the policy framework as well, is that what we're doing and when we think about what we're doing in Ireland. Um, so the Marine Strategy Framework Directive, which I already mentioned, and um, it's that's how we report back to Europe on our marine environment, um, and we report, report back on um, good environmental status uh, of our seas and waters, um, and that that has a program of measures, and then that was recently published. The program of measures for Ireland was recently published to, um, towards the end of last year, and nature restoration and nature-based solutions in particular are the, it has been recognised within that. So there is. There is kind of an ambition in the program of measures for Ireland that by 2028, um, we will have developed nature-based solutions um, to, to safeguard uh, the natural capacity of ecosystems. And um, so, yes, that's something you know we'll see. I think even more as as uh, these th these things become more operational, nature restoration laws in in, in place and so on. And um, the other area is there is. Um, there's a lot of work going on, so it's not just nationally. You know, our seas, they don't have any um, borders. That's something to bear in mind as well. So we have to work with our our, um, our neighbours. And there is, you know, an international um, uh, commission, OSPAR it's called. And so we work very closely with 15 other government agencies and the, and the European Union um, to, to safeguard at that international, international regional um, scale. And within OSPAR, there are ambitions as well around nature-based solutions. So, that, so this, there is a lot of activity, well, there's new activity, shall I say, happening around around that. So that's really positive to see that we're working. And it also gives us that way to work with our closest neighbours now that they're not part of the European Union. So we, we work very closely with them through that through OSPAR. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention to you is um, we have we have a number of uh, projects that we've either funded or that we're undertaking around uh, you know, nature restoration and nature-based solutions. And I, one area that Lucy already touched on was the oysters. And there's a project on uh, restoration of oysters up in, um, in Galway Bay. And it's, 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 
it's a good project. It's scientifically, it's really important. But the other thing as well that's really positive about it is it's working with the local community. Coon Bio is a group within Galway Bay, and they're actually involved in it. So this is this is really important, um, you know, from the point of view of involvement of communities as well. And um, so yeah, so and that, that project has been undertaken to look at you know restoration of the native oysters. And I, I suppose the reason for it, the the the, to, the reason to restore oysters um, is that you know they're really important from the point of view of you know improving water quality, um, also increasing uh, fish production, and um, they have a very important cultural value as well. That you know so there's, there's a lot of reasons why we should be uh, improving and restoring our native oysters. And um, the reasons for uh, the reasons for our habitat, um, are, you know, the reason for the, the decline of the oysters originally was you know around the fishing. And their habitat decline. Um, they, they were also, you know, lots of facilitation and sedimentation around the uh, in their habitats. So, so that project has looked at actions to actually restore um, the the oysters. So that they they've sort of taken a number of different approaches. One is where they've like looked at different habitat suitability and they've increased the substrate of the oysters um, to try and. Uh, to encourage their their um, their growth, and they've also they've also um, kind of implemented management plans, and they have they they settled in. They've, they've actually put in um, oysters to settle within areas and so on. So it's a really really positive project. There's another one I just want to mention as well. Um, that's around restoration of sand dunes, and that's a bit closer closer to here. It's in Brandon, Brandon Bay, so it's, it's close to me to say as a crow flies. Um, so that's one that NUIG are doing, and um, they're they're looking at how how they can they can work with the local community to restore um, the sand dunes and um, down there. So that's another really interesting one to, to probably hear more about. So I think I will leave it there for now um, and pass back to Tim. Um, thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Katrina. We have about 30 minutes or so for, for questions and answers. Uh, so I'm going to try and modulate between uh, the people that are here uh, in the hall and the people that are watching online. Uh, and indeed, the people in the hall here, if you're shy about asking a question, you can also use Slido. Uh, just to remind <laughs> you, uh, the Slido code is 3386715. But while you're here in the audience, we're sort of beginning to warm up and think of your questions. I'm going to turn immediately to, uh, to Slido to a question that came in. And it's a question that's addressed, in fact, to each of the, of the panellists. Uh, and I do it in turn. I start with Grace, and then Lucy, and then Katrina. And the question is, what does the sea mean to you? And are you optimistic or pessimistic about the future of the seas? Let's start with Grace. Um, the, what does the sea mean to me? I think it's been answered a little bit by the others already. But for me, similar to Lucy, I grew up beside the sea. It means everything to me. It's my reset button. So when I come back from from um, Brussels or Strasbourg or anywhere, um, even you know last year traveling to the Sustainable Development Goal to high level meetings in New York, the minute I get back from Tremor, I'm down to the sea for a swim. Um, and I think a lot of people around Ireland, and because of our proximity to the sea, recognise the importance of the sea in that regard. So that's well-being and health. What's the sea for me in terms of food? It's you know the fish that's the, that I can get in the market if I I'm home in Tremor or even yesterday, um, over on the Dingle Peninsula, fresh uh, seafood delivered uh, from uh, the back of a van. Um, or in the markets or in the supermarkets. It's the best of food, most nutritious. Um, you know, and then it, and then I start thinking, okay, well who delivers that food, you know, to us and how can you know the fishing communities be sustained and so there's all that well being, there's food, there's health, there's uh, recreation and then I suppose um, I'm, I'm just um, at 12 o'clock I was looking at the Eurosport competition in, um, in uh, Portugal and my nephew was surfing for Ireland um, and he came in third um, in the longboarding so as an old surfer as well and I know there's other surfers here yeah it's brilliant so um, you know, that's, that's the association um, and I think uh, we are known uh, internationally um, as a people of the sea, and that's why it's really important that we uh, mind it. But the health of the ocean is important, and not to forget 
the, the water around Ireland, the coastal water, the seas, the Celtic Sea, the Irish Sea, the, the Atlantic Ocean, you know, like we have lots of different seas, bays and all of that. And it's written in our it's written in our heritage and in you know um, so many poems and that it's so much part of our culture. So for me the sea is hugely important. Okay, thank you, thank you, Grace. Actually, that was a little bit longer than, than I expected. Oh, sorry. As an <laughs> I love the sea. <laughs> I know you love the sea. Sorry. Uh, so I, I think that maybe we give the other two panelists a chance in the context of other questions to add, you know, what it is that turns you on about the sea. But no, I just want to involve the audience here. Has anybody got a specific, a specific question that they would like to ask? We have a roving microphone here. Jay's just going to bring it around. Uh, could you just please explain who you are uh, before you ask a question? Yeah, thank Russell. Yeah. Hello? Okay, right. So um, I have lots of questions, but I'll just ask one, which might be typical uh, about the questions I want to ask in general, which I won't do. Um, when we talk about restoration, what are we restoring back to? I mean, I can't, you know, as an engineer scientist, I'd need to know what the goal is in quantification numbers. What are we aiming at? Um, uh, one observation, that's a question, one observation I have, as a blow into this area about uh, 20 years ago, I see that um, it's easy to get complacent on the Irish coast. And it's really, really easy to get and feel complacent because it looks so beautiful. But don't mm -hmm. equate looks with good environment. Mm -hmm. In fact, the land is a desert around here. And I know that from my own experience. And the rivers, the rivers here are carrying a lot of burden of pollution into the seas. So there is a link between the land and the seas, which I would like to hear. Well, I won't ask the question. I'll just, I'll just pose that observation. Thank you. Oh, okay, thank you. And just to explain to the audience, uh, that microphone that we have is so that the people who are watching remotely can hear what you're saying, uh, so it doesn't broadcast uh, into, the, into the auditorium, but everybody who's watching uh, can actually see. Um, Lucy, do you mind if I throw that question to you? I mean, are the farmers at fault here? Uh, should the fisher people throw stones at the farmers? Can we start that debate? Uh, how far should they go? I mean, we're all in this together. Uh, what's your conclusion? Yeah, no, it's a, a great observation, and I know it well as well. There's a lot of um, farm areas being tills now and, and what which were actual habitat and now they are just monoculture um, grass and um, way less biodiversity in those areas that we all know and there are good programs like farming for biodiversity but they're a minority um, definitely need more joined up thinking um, I'm not going to point the finger at anybody but we know everybody has a part to play in it, even from our rubbish at home, you know, um, and trying to reduce how much plastic ends up in our recycling bins. So we all have a part to play in it. Um, yes, I would like to see a lot more um, farming for biodiversity and a lot more awareness around the need for that. Um, it's really, really important. And just, at, as you say, the interface between the rivers and the sea um, if you put in a riparian zone, like an area that has good vegetation, it helps to filter, it helps to stabilize before it actually enters the um, river and then it's cleaner water going down into. So all of that needs to be brought into these plans as we go forward. Um, and um, going back to the optimistic and pessimistic question, I'm an ever optimist, but I'm a realist also. So I know if we leave nature alone, it will look after itself, but we're not doing that. But if we give it a hand into re restoration, then we can actually really achieve a lot together. So it's, it's again coming back to being part of nature and working with nature and all of us trying to bring that into our mentality, I think. Excellent, thank you. Uh, I'm going to turn to our online audience now and take a question from, from Slido. And it starts off with a, with a comment uh, saying thanks to everybody and the uh, person who writes the question thinks that there's great hope for the, for the future. But uh, as with all bouquets, there's a little break in the middle of it. 
Uh, and the question really is, given that you know we didn't meet our target for, for 2020, and I'm sort of looking at Katrina here because you're the one that crunches the numbers, uh, what do you think that we need to do to make sure the 30% target is successful? What actions should the government be undertaking? I know that you're advising the minister, but what actions are really necessary so that we can really achieve our targets? Well, I suppose um, I think the key thing is to get the, the new legislation enacted. The, the bill has to be uh, enacted. So there's a process there that we can develop in more protected areas in Ireland. Um, so that's, that's a, a key thing. Um, I think other areas where I, I see um, gaps through my own work is making sure that we have the baseline information to inform decisions. So that while, while the um, stakeholder involvement is a key thing um, and talking to, to, to the communities, the fishermen and so on that, are, that will be affected by marine protected areas, that's really important and that process will continue. But also making sure that the, the scientific evidence is there, making sure that we know the species, we know the areas that, that are sensitive and that need to be, to be protected. That's particularly important when it comes to the times where, where we're going to have to tr make trade-offs or potentially make trade-offs between different activities in different areas, for, for example. Um, so yeah, there are areas. The other thing, another area where I think is, um, it's really important is, is skills. We don't, we don't necessarily have enough skilled people in, in Ireland, and I think we need to make sure we're building that skilled education base and, and that programs like the Explorers program that Lucy just mentioned, you know, building that out, making sure that, that third level students know that there's opportunities to um, to follow marine careers as well and make sure that we can in, in the future in ten years time that we will have a skilled workforce to, to support marine protected areas and other like offshore wind developments and so on. Make sure that it's all done sustainably. Optimism or pessimism? Oh absolute op optimism. I think I see the the, the sea I mean I think in Ireland in general, I feel people have, have, don't really appreciate, you know, I mean, I, I know you probably don't, we have a panel here of three people who, who understand and appreciate, but in general, people don't appreciate the value of the sea. And I think I see, I see much more turn now. In the last maybe three, four years, there's so many people, um, probably really since the, the war in Ukraine as well, there's more awareness of the sea and more awareness of our offshore wind opportunities. And I have so much um, optimism for the future. I think, yeah. Um, it's fantastic to see so much optimism at this side of the table anyway. So we turn again to our physical audience. Uh, is there any other burning question that somebody has? I see about four questions asked for. So uh, JJ, can you give the microphone to this lady? Again, the microphone doesn't uh, broadcast here. It's for the people to come to listen. Norman, you've heard the sound of them. Color or tool. Uh, Norma Moriarty, local county councillor. And look, thank you very much for your presentation, for coming to Ottawa, the centre of the universe. You're always welcome here. Um, I, I suppose there are several things. One, just a very practical thing. Lucy, you mentioned there about the council's climate action plan not mentioning uh, res restoration and so on. Opportune time. Yeah. It's open for consultation, and it, that consultation closes on the August the 8th. So it's very important that you reference that, give people the opportunity to get the submissions in. Um, and it's consult.kerrycoco.ie so get get on those submissions the optimism thing is something that's been going around in my head for a while I was listening to a program by Mankin Omangan on the road one evening and he had a Dutch um, research professor on with him whose name escapes me but and, and he was brilliant absolutely brilliant talking about you know our environment and so on but he said he feels there's a crisis in optimism which is as dangerous as the crisis in the environment at the moment mm -hmm. because he said a, a whole host of young people were asked the question are you optimistic about the future uh, and he said there was a 30 percent positive response to that whereas in the past it would have been over 90 percent and that's that's frightening because if we don't believe we can achieve it your 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 make your your job a lot more difficult, um, and I I I think that the what has happened I suppose what we witnessed in Europe and what we have witnessed over the last couple of weeks I think is really anyone who had any doubts I think they're now of the realization this is happening at a really frightening pace, uh, and it's not about the survival of the planet but the survival of human beings' capacity to exist on what that planet will look like, so it is our own you know future and the future generations obviously we're looking after. I'm a pragmatist, right? I'm not an idealistic uh, individual of any shape or form. I'm a pragmatist. We have a resource at our disposal in terms of clean energy production and, and offshore wind energy. Are we going to hamstring ourselves to the degree that we actually don't harness that 
to the point where we can actually make a difference in terms of producing that clean energy. And that's my worry and my concern, I'll be honest. We need to do it, and how do we do it in a way that we actually can do it quickly enough to make a difference? Okay, listen, thank you so much for that. Um, can I turn to Grace to answer that, uh, the final part of that question, Grace? Yeah. Yes. Uh, thanks very much, Councillor, and, and it's great to see you here, um, and thanks for that news about the consultation process as well, really important. Um, I would say I'm nervous. I'm very, very, very nervous at the moment because I have for years seen opportunity and I've seen opportunities missed. And that's why, uh, but at the same time, I'm, uh, I genuinely believe that we need to uh, have consultation process, but we need to also get on with it. And I think this summer, more than ever, we've seen that we better get the hell on with it because otherwise it will be a hell on earth. And that's what, like people have, I said to people, this is extraordinary, the burning that's going on around the planet. The, the, the extreme weather that we knew, we were told would happen, it's happening. So um, in Ireland's case, we, uh, the legislation um, to enable the, the uh, offshore wind is there now. Um, we have just, I think uh, last week or the week before, MARA, the Marine um, Authority, to regulate the, um, the uh, offshore um, uh, requests uh, has been put into place. Um, so, um, and that's led by um, Mark Mellish. So I know they're very, um, they're, they have a job of work and they have a program of work and they're getting on with it. And so it will happen uh, fairly quickly. Uh, but what I'm nervous about is that, and I'm, I'm just being realistic here, and it, it kind of goes back to your own question there about the restoration. Change is hard for people to stomach, and um, you know, myself included. And, um, but I recognize that things are going to have to happen, and we're going to have to uh, compromise. And you know, for us, the art of politics is compromise, and you give and take. <coughs> but it's to bring the communities on board and the people around the country and to listen. And we had such, like there were public meetings on that nature restoration law where there were climate deniers uh, around the table, you know, where people were balking back. And now I think, more than ever, and I don't care who we are or who we, you are, but now we need leadership and real leadership. And we need people at the table who are prepared to, to very quickly, and it has to be done with haste now, to take things on board and to have whatever you want to call it to move forward. They're going to have to have the grit and the courage and the, the absolute determination. There's nothing in there, I would say, about uh, being um, you know, naive or anything. Hard decisions must be made and they must be made soon. And if we don't put together loads of parts, like you were saying, Katrina, about the skilling and all of the rest, uh, we're, we're, and that's what I'm telling you, I'm genuinely nervous, because I'm afraid if we don't do it, and we don't take the courage, and we don't have the leadership, um, that we, we will, uh, literally, we will, that percentage you talked about, the 30%, we'll see it falling again. So we need that political courage now more than ever. And the legislation, since I've been in politics only a few short years, since 2016, the legislation's been enabled um, uh, at pace, but now we need to get the momentum. And like I said to you, it won't suit everyone to see the turbines out there. It really won't suit everyone. It mightn't be, you know, like some people like them, some don't. But if we don't get on with it, um, we're genuinely in trouble. I, I think it goes back to what this gentleman yeah. said. You know, I, I'm sorry, for, but just the point is important that it might yeah, be It's just that no, nobody looking uh, from abroad. Because the they have. These oh, people yeah. are important too. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> that, no, that, that if you don't see it and uh, you think it's fine, so what's happening underneath, it might be obtrusive physically, but it's creating a cleaner environment underneath, and that's what we should be Okay, so it's a clean, envir clean environment, long term, uh, and you know, even if it doesn't look uh, doesn't look good, uh, we still have to have it. And I think, I mean, uh, that was the point you made at, at the start. You know, we've got to find a solution uh, to the move away from from fossil fuels. And Ireland seems to be one of the best areas, certainly in Europe, 
uh, for harnessing these resources to create this uh, renewable renewable fuel. No, I saw two more questions here. There's a gent uh, sorry, a lady back up here and another lady here. So let's take the lady on my right hand side on top, please, JJ. Uh, so once again, if you can speak loud so we can hear you, but people watching can hear you from that way. Sure. Um, yeah, I totally relate to Grace's fear. Um, I know we absolutely have to do something, um, but I have an equal fear and we've made so many mistakes already. I really fear for making the same bloody mistakes over again and that we will sacrifice our ocean territories, the ocean and everything you hold dear to uh, offshore wind all around the world. We're not just talking about Ireland. Ireland committing to it is just a part of Europe committing to it is a part of the entire globe committing to it. And nobody talks about the rare earth elements required, the copper required, the disturbance from the magnetic fields that are inevitable, and the life cycle analysis are only predictions because we don't have experience of it. It's only been in place for 20 years. And you and I, Grace, we know we're contemporaries. We know the ideals we started out with in the 80s have shifted and changed and we've compromised and we've given up on dreams over and over again. And I fear for my children and their future that we are walking blindfolded into similar mistakes because everybody knows it's money rules the world, not personal philosophies, not heart and hope. It's actual money that's ruining us and is ruining the planet. And incessant perpetual economic growth is unsustainable. Okay. Yes, I know. No, no, no th th thank th you. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Just give a very quick so th thank you very much for that. I mean, that is the other side of the discussion, and this is why we're here to hear every side of, of what's happening. So thank you very much for that. I'm sorry. No, no, that, that, that's, per that's perfectly fine. Thank you so much for putting that on the table because you need to think about that as well. I want to take a question here, a last question uh, from the audience from the lady on my, my left hand side with the sunglasses on her head. Uh, thank you very much. I didn't realise they were still there. Um, my name is Cleo Murphy. I'm the Green Party representative for the area, so delighted to see Grace uh, and the others here today. Grace, I was glad to hear you talking about food coming from, from the Marine because it's one of those things that doesn't get talked about enough. And I have a real concern that um, when we talk about bringing stakeholders along with us, we need to have much better communication with the, the, the small fishermen, the inshore fishermen and the aquaculture people, especially in this bay, Kenmare Bay, like the, the wider Kenmare Bay. Um, and, and also to hear Katrina speaking about the marine economy, and I'd like to hear more about that. I was at a, a conference here in this this very room a couple of months ago about um, it, it was the end of, it was the completion of the life project and there was a lot of talk about our tourism and seafood is so much a part of our offering it's what makes us special on the Iveraugh Peninsula um, in 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 terms of people coming down so I, there's a lot of legislation and layers of legislation between what's happening nationally and what's happening in Europe. And, and I picked out a line from, and, and it's confusing a lot of the fishermen, and they're terrified as to what does marine protection mean in, t in terms of restricting them. They very often don't see it in terms of trying to boost the stock again, but you know, we'll, we'll, we'll try and keep that conversation going. Um, so just, just one line I wanted to read from the Sustainable um, Development Goals, which a lot of people here are familiar with, and, and goal 14 is to conserve and sustainably use the ocean seas and marine resources. And within that is the line, to provide access for small-scale artisanal fishers to marine resources and markets. And I think we just need to keep that in mind as well. We're protecting the seas for a reason, and food and fishing is part of it. Thanks. Okay, thank you. 
Grace, can I ask you to address the comments made by those two contributors, please? And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to give everybody a, a chance to, to summarise the discussion we've had today because we're coming close to the end of, uh, of the session. Grace. Thanks, Tim. Um, I, I'm going to go at speed now. Um, firstly, look, uh, I completely feel your, your pain and your sorrow uh, in, in that nervous fear. One of the things that I've been pushing in the European Parliament since the day I went in in 2019 is to stop subsidising. So stop putting public money, our money, to subsidise already very profitable uh, industries. So that includes the fossil industry, that includes the, the industrial fishers, of which we have some here in Ireland, who are extremely profitable at the cost of the, the coastal fishers, the, 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 the inshore fishers that need, need to be supported because they're going to deliver the food right down to your market so that we start to look at the, 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 the cost of um, the carbon footprint of getting food onto tables and that, but the subsidies. So public money for years has been going in to subsidizing very, very, well-off farmers, very well-off uh, fisher people, you know, and it's just, it's just not on. The money has to, and that's the fairness, has to go in to supporting those who pr produce the, the good food, farming with nature, with support mechanisms from Europe, and to deliver f food that hasn't been destroyed by chemicals and fertilizers, that is costing farmers more money to put those imports into land. So there's a lot of work to be done in that regard. I suppose what keeps me going is the fire in my tummy, because I get frustrated and angry, and then I feel, you know, let's get a move on. So looking, looking for uh, solutions. We have to keep, we have to keep that uh, hope going, you know? Um, and then in terms of what Leo was saying, Absolutely, I mean, you know, the waters, like if you look at the marine spatial planning in Ireland, like in the short few years I've been around the, the, the coast here, you know, we see an increase in the ferries going from, from Ireland now to Europe, which we welcome, but it's increase in traffic. We see increase in um, so many different, um, uh, the, the recreational uh, space around Ireland. We see now the offshore. We see, we, you know, when I was growing up, uh, when I was young in Tremor, and we had a small boat in the in the pier, and we used to fill it with mackerel. If the place was awash with mackerel, you can't even catch five now. You know, for a few days. So they, we've seen the species. That's your point. The species are in decline. We need to turn that around, and we need to to support the the um, communities who are farming and fishing and de uh, delivering the solutions. So another solution, you know, is something simple like the oat milk. Do you know, it's a solution. Not everyone wanted to keep drinking cow's milk. So, th oh, there are solutions. So we have to keep that, that solutions oriented um, and, and the kind of innovative thinking going uh, because uh, we have no choice and you are Oh, entirely right. I'm getting more and more angry with the corporate system that is destroying the earth. But we FDIs are going to be supporting all this with plants like this. Foreign direct, direct investment that's going to be paying for most of our offshore wind. Like, I mean, but that's know, why not even ours. Yeah, but one of the things we've been working on is community-based wind system as well. Yeah, you know, they still have to have FDIs to support them. They're only a tiny part of every yeah, project. But then we have to we have to build the awareness, see the opportunities where we can make sure not subsidise. We there's no, stop there's not subsidising. There's money involved in the co-ops and the community projects. Like it's not the, the person, the old, the elderly person in a cold house without insulation and a decent roof that's actually going to benefit from these projects. It's people out in Europe, ultimately, who have industry that we will be supplying our. Excess to no, that, that's no, and that's Irish, not right. And Irish people are still no. The energy, the energy that will be produced will be delivered onshore here in Ireland. Yes, that, that's that's first and foremost. In the event that we have excess, but we have to start. We have to start producing clean energy. We have to get away from fossil fuels. Keep them in the ground. And the prediction is that we will be paying yeah, more yeah. than the average yeah. European for electricity. Listen, um, Grace, uh, the Ireland South. Uh, 
Green Power Hill Key. Promised that you would stay around a little bit after the event uh, for people to speak to. So maybe you would speak to her. Yeah, uh, we're going to wrap things up now very, very soon. Uh, but I have one last question from, from the audience. There is there's a man there who's been patiently waiting, a gentleman with a beard and glasses. We'll take your question and then we go back to the panel for, for a quick roundup. Thank, thank you very much. My name is Gerard. I'm one of the blow ins here. So I'm addressing my local politician and my, one of my neighbours. Um, <coughs> I, have a, I have a question that really addresses to these people, certainly my neighbours. Where are the local environment, where's the local environment action group? Where is this in Ireland? I come from another existence in another country, and at the corner there was a citizens action group. And the citizens action group really, really did look after the environment and looked after the people around. Please allow me, I have three questions, but they're all basically the same. <coughs> How does the local environment action group link in to local government? That's the second question, and indeed a question to you. Where is the EU support for this? We're supporting government from top down. Why aren't we supporting government from bottom up? And we are the people that are at the sharp end. We are the ones looking after the environment. We are in the middle of it. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, local questions, local person to answer local questions. Lucy, turn to you first. Yeah. Sure, thanks for the um, question. So there's a couple of local um, groups here. The all being one, Boss Alex Environmental Action Group, do amazing work um, with restoration and beach cleans. Sea Synergy and Tidy Towns Waterfall, um, we team up and do beach cleans as well. And we're doing the research so that we can help inform policies in the long term. So we make submissions to um, to climate change action and, and all of that to policy. Um, EU support is a good question because just yesterday I was emailing the council wondering what had happened to the local agenda 21 and the community environmental action fund that we used to always be able to go out to the community and raise awareness about marine life and talk about how we can all be stewards of the ocean. Um, and that's been taken away since COVID, really. And I, I want to get back out there into the community and do that work. Um, so they've been helpful and sent us on some other um, ways of getting funding. So we need to look into that now. And, and so there are pockets of money, but it is hard to find it. But it, there needs to be more, for sure. And hearing about the Marine Institute and the um, research grants that will be coming on board and stuff is positive. But that's, that's all I can... Um, contribute to that really, yeah. Um, maybe Norma knows more about the grants. Yeah. Uh, can we do by that <coughs> afterwards? If, yeah. if you can say just a couple of minutes uh, and give the information, it'd be fantastic. But I, I want to close up now because we promised people we'd close at a certain time, so uh, it's nice to be able to do that. But I want to close by asking a question to each person on the panel. Uh, and maybe I'll start backwards, Katrina, Lucy, and, and Grace. Uh, and my question is as follows. Let's suppose for one moment that you're omnipotent and that you have a sack load of money. Mm. What is your solution to the problems currently facing uh, the Irish Marine? Um, with a sack load of money? I don't, I don't think it's a, a money issue. Um, to me, I, I think there's a, I, you know, I, th I think I'd like to see more um, local engagement. I think it's more about communications and making sure that people are brought along on the journey. There's just so much happening now that I, I think you know, people need to be informed about all the activities. You know, just to come back to, you know, as an example to that question around um, council action plans and things like that, since the publication of Ireland's Marine Spatial Plan, the, the National Marine Panel Framework, um, councils now only very recently have started to come and started thinking about the marine side of things. It's only very new, really, in, in their thoughts. And, uh, you know, to me, that's great. Like, it's only in the last maybe 18 months that we have had direct engagement with county councils um, looking for signs and looking for evidence to support their, their action plans. So I, I don't actually think necessarily it's, it's about a sack load of money. Okay, for, for me that's a very interesting result because you know when people are talking to us in the European Commission everybody says you know we need money, we need money and we have the, uh, the fisheries programme, we have environmental programmes, we have all different programmes but I mean what you're saying to me basically is that you know it's up to the people in the, in the local area to start doing things. Okay, that's very, that's very interesting. Okay, Lucy can you add to that? Would you disagree? 
Um, I think there's definitely money there for, for research, for conservation, but it's very hard to access it a lot of the time. You nearly need to employ another person to apply for the grants. Um, so it's really hard to, to reach it. Um, so I don't think there's a one hit wonder when it comes to um, nature restoration and, and a habitable planet. I think it's a, a mixture of everything, really, from awareness, education, skills, um, understanding the environment. I think in dubio pro natura, in doubt, err on the side of nature. It's really important that we do that. When we're talking about the green transition, we are talking about people being fearful of things that can happen, but we cannot take the green or the blue out of the green transition. So we need to be cognizant of where we put those wind turbines, that they are not next to um, one of the largest gannet colonies or next to one of the puffin um, breeding sites, that they are in places that the wildlife and nature can still thrive and not be affected by it. I totally am on board for the green transition. Um, I think MPAs are vital. Um, we're going way past the sell by date for MPAs. We need better enforced MPAs. There's an amazing one in Lyme Bay in England. And since they've um, had that MPA, they, the fishermen have seen a 370% increase in fish catches in that area from that MPA being enforced there. So it's not just about having SACs and MPAs, it's about enforcement and the community being on board for those MPAs. So in dubio pro natura. Okay, thanks. Uh, SAC for the Initiated Specialty of Conservation and MPA is the Marine <laughs> Protection Area. And uh, a little bit of Latin thrown in as well, just to okay. confuse everyone. Uh, listen, um, Grace, you've just got about one minute left, a sack load of money, and you're all powerful. I absolutely agree with Katrina. I don't think it's thrown money is going to work in this regard, um, even though putting some money behind community energy pro wind projects would, would go some way. Um, the funding mechanisms have to be easier to get at. And just to go back to your point about the local authorities and the ground up, I think the, the awareness is building, but it, it needs to build now at scale. Uh, but the local authorities, I agree with you, I think the local authorities need to be far more empowered and obviously you wouldn't be surprised with me saying I would like to see lots more greens on the local authorities mm -hmm. because that's, you know, we might be, we might be the most popular in the press or whatever, but we have, we have the vision, you know. So um, it's really to uh, to empower all the strata, and then to come back to Lucy's point, a place for everything, uh, everything in its place. Um, you know, uh, um, the precautionary principle. I always loved it. Like we 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 have an opportunity. The nature restoration law is on the table. It's go still going through the processes. So maybe your summer reading could be just to gen up on that and to use that legislation wherever you can to put pressure in, in your own communities to build um, awareness. Thanks. Grace, Grace, people need a sack load of money. It's Irish water. Uh, okay, so one, one of our, one person from yeah. the um, audience says that the people who need the sack load of money are, are Irish water, and which goes back to the, the point made earlier about uh, the rivers not being the cleanest and disgorging themselves in, into the seas. Listen, uh, by the way, the party political broadcast on behalf of the Green Party is due to the fact <laughs> that Grace held the microphone at the time, no other reason. Uh, listen, I want to thank you all so much for coming out on, on this lovely evening. Uh, it's been great being here with you. I want to thank our uh, online audience for watching us and for all the questions. I particularly want to thank the excellent panellists. Uh, you've made this thing absolutely special. Uh, our contractors for the event, uh, We The People, thank you very much, uh, guys, for, for organising. And my, my colleague Cathy was here in the front, here in the front uh, looking after everything uh, and also in the background organising the event. So listen, thank you so much uh, for your attention. I hope that you found it interesting. As I said at the start, this is part of, of a process that we have, which is for the European Commission to go out to local areas and speak a little bit about the things that we think are very important and which we hope that you think are important after having listened to this. 
So I just wish you all a safe home and thank you very much again. Bye bye. <laughs>